yeah, we're finally going to be doing some math again. Let's do it. But to introduce what we're going to be doing, first, I'm going to start by reading straight off the NDTED.org website. And just so you know, NDT stands for Non-Destructive Testing. It's basically a college course to be certified in testing various materials without actually breaking them. And this website was actually written by the instructors to help the students. So if anybody would know something about calculating various qualities of a material, it's them. Sound propagation in elastic materials. In the previous pages, it was pointed out that sound waves propagate due to vibrations or oscillatory motions of particles within a material. An ultrasonic wave may be visualized as an infinite number of oscillating masses or particles connected by means of elastic springs. Each individual particle is influenced by the motion of its nearest neighbor and both inertial and elastic restoring forces act upon each particle. A mass on a spring has a single resonant frequency determined by its spring constant K and its mass, M. The spring constant is the restoring force of the spring per unit of length. Within the elastic limit of any material, there is a linear relationship between the displacement of a particle and the force attempting to restore the particle to its equilibrium position. This linear dependency is described by Hooke's Law. In terms of the spring model, Hooke's Law says that the restoring force due to a spring is proportional to the length that the string is stretched and acts in the opposite direction. Mathematically, Hooke's Law is written as F equals negative KX, where F is the force, K is the spring constant, and X is the amount of particle displacement. Please note that the spring is applying a force to the particle that is equal and opposite to the force pulling down on the particle. The speed of sound. Hooke's law, when used along with Newton's second law, can explain a few things about the speed of sound. The speed of sound within the material is a function of the properties of the material and is independent of the amplitude of the sound wave. Newton's second law says that the force applied to a particle will be balanced by the particle's mass and the acceleration of the particle. Mathematically, Newton's second law is written as F equals MA. Hooke's law then says that this force will be balanced by a force in the opposite direction that is dependent on the amount of displacement in the spring constant, F equals negative KX. Therefore, since the applied force and the restoring force are equal, MA equals negative KX can be written. The negative sign indicates that the force is in the opposite direction. Since the mass M and the spring constant K are constants for any given material, it can be seen that the acceleration A and the displacement X are the only variables. It can also be seen that they are directly proportional. For instance, if the displacement of a particle increases, so does acceleration. It turns out that the time it takes the particle to move and return to its equilibrium position is independent of the force applied. So, within a given material, sound always travels at the same speed no matter how much force is applied when other variables, such as temperature, are held constant. What properties of material affect the speed of sound? Of course, sound does travel at different speeds in different materials. This is because the mass of the atomic particles and their spring constants are different for different materials. The mass of the particles is related to the density of the material, and the spring constant is related to the elastic constants of the material. The general relationship between the speed of sound in a solid and its density and elastic constants is given by the following equation. V equals the square root of C sub IJ over P, where V is the speed of sound, C is the elastic constant, and P is the material density. This equation may take on a number of forms depending on the wave, blah, 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 blah. See, this is where it gets off course and it doesn't really apply because they're talking about the speed of sound between different atoms. We're talking about the speed of sound and the nucleus itself. But you can see that the spring constant thing still applies to the speed of sound. So that's what we're going to be using. And if that didn't all make sense, don't worry about it. That's just the introduction to see that this is the actual method used by real scientists to calculate the speed of sound in a medium. And what we're going to be using are all well-known equations in terms of spring constants and all that, but Frank was really the first person in the world to calculate the speed of sound of the nucleus using this method. No one else has even thought of it. No one, no one else has really paid attention, I guess. But remember, in the case of the nucleus, this speed of sound that we're talking about has nothing to do with audible sound waves. We're just calling it that as an analogy to mechanical waves. So, to start off, let's look at Coulomb's energy equation, which I talked about in previous segments. E equals 2Q squared over 4 pi E sub O, which is the permittivity of free space, times 1 over X. All these terms should make sense. The Q is a Coulomb charge. 
Isabo, we've already been over that. You know what pi is probably if you don't get out of here. And the x stands for the displacement. So all this equation is doing is telling you the energy produced by two interacting charges. And that whole fractional part of the equation, the 2q squared over 4 pi e sub o can be combined into what's called an aggregate constant, k, which is a spring constant that was spoken of a minute ago. So when we combine those things into the new constant, the aggregate constant, then this equation simply becomes e equals k times 1 over x. But now let me explain what this spring constant k actually means. See, the term spring constant is a little counterintuitive in that it's actually variable by how far you're displacing the spring. But basically, the spring constant is determined by the maximum force that you could exert onto the spring, which in the case of an actual spring would be the maximum force you could push the spring down until it touches. And so this, this maximum force is the only thing that stays constant in the spring constant. So if you just take that maximum force referred to as F max and divide it by the displacement, in other words, how far you're actually compressing the spring, then that gives you the spring constant K. There you go. So K equals F max over the displacement, X. But now let's go back to the equation we saw a minute ago. E equals K times 1 over X. And don't worry if this next step doesn't make any sense to you yet. I'll explain it in the next part of the series. This equation could be rearranged into the standard form that you find in Physics 101 textbooks, which is E equals 1 half K times X squared. And this equation is just telling you the energy contained in a spring by knowing that spring constant and how far the spring has been displaced. And by the way, just so you can impress people with your newfound nerdacity. And yes, that is a word. Well, it is now that I coined it. But if you want to really impress people less nerdy than you, or think you're impressing them anyway, you can call any equation that shows you the energy of the system a Hamiltonian equation. And the equations that show you the strength of the forces are Newtonian equations. So all of these energy equations that we've been dealing with are Hamiltonian. So now we're actually going to plug some numbers into the Hamiltonian equation for the energy of a spring. First of all, we need to know the F max. As this is really the only constant in our spring constant, remember? Because the displacement can be changed, but we'll give it a value that makes perfect sense in a minute. But for the F max, in the case of two protons, the maximum expansive force between them is right at the radius of the columbic barrier. And if you remember this from the previous segments, the columbic barrier is the radius at which the strength of the strong nuclear force is equal to the strength of the repulsive electrostatic force. So you could push these protons together and they're going to push apart and they're going to push apart from each other. And once you get them past this columbic barrier, once you get them right at it, then the strong nuclear force equals electrostatic force and there's no force between them. So the force max is only up until that point. And let's call the radius of the columbic barrier R sub C, but it's also called the classical radius of the proton in all of Frank's papers. But if you actually put two protons together to their respective columbic barriers, the displacement between them at both their maximum forces is actually two times R sub C. It's two times the columbic radius because you can only put two circles together until they touch, and then the displacement between them is actually two times the radius of the circles. And the maximum force exerted between two repelling protons is 29.05 newtons. So that's what we're going to be using for the F max in our spring constant. And that's all the information we need from now because we could add in the displacement later. And it just so happens that two times this columbic radius, which we just saw with calculating this F max, or 2R sub C, is also the classical radius of the electron. And that's not the only similarity between the protons and the electrons, as you'll find out shortly. So now let me introduce the next little goodie, which can also be found in any physics textbook. The equation for simple harmonic motion using the spring constant. It says that the frequency of harmonic motion is equal to 1 half pi times the square root of k over m. K being our good friend, which we all know well by this point in time, and this is kind of reminding me of school with all this learning and educating, so let's name him Kegger, so we can kind of chill out. What's up, Kegger? Hey, Kegs. And, of course, M stands for mass. So, to envision this whole thing, let's imagine that we're in zero gravity 
aboard the ISS. And now imagine that you have a spring with a ball attached to the end of it. You can compress the spring a little ways and let it go. The ball in the spring will start to oscillate and it has nothing to do with gravity. And the rate at which the spring bounces back and forth at, the frequency, is determined solely by the weight of that ball that's attached to it and the spring constant of the spring, which includes the information for how far we displaced it. And in a perfect world scenario with no entropy going on, which causes the spring to lose energy each time it oscillates, the spring would just keep bouncing back and forth forever at this steady rate. And another basic equation from any Physics 101 textbook is that the square root of k over m is equal to the Greek letter omega, aka the angular frequency, which in the lowercase looks sort of like a w. Hey, that's where w went. Hey, w, what's up? Dude, shut up. You're embarrassing me. Okay, the angular frequency is just the measure of how many times something revolves per unit of time. So you can measure the angular frequency of how many times your tires are turning per second, for instance. But angular frequency is only really useful for things that rotate. So for the speed of sound of the nucleus, we're only talking a linear frequency of mechanical waves. It's going in a straight line, going out. So, because we want this in terms of a linear frequency, not an angular frequency, and the angular frequency equals the regular frequency times 2 pi, all we have to do is divide the square root of k over m, which, remember, is equal to omega by 2 pi. But instead of dividing by 2 pi, you can also multiply it by 1 half pi, which is just another way of saying the same thing. So, now we have our equation. F sub n equals 1 half pi times the square root of k over m, and in this case, m will be the average mass of the nucleons. And of course, we know that the spring constant is actually variable, so let's plug in our F max of 29.05 newtons, and for the displacement, let's plug in the actual radius of the nucleons. Well, again, because you can only put two circles together until they touch, the displacement will be twice the radius of the nucleons. So we see that the frequency of the mechanical waves in the nucleus equals one half pi times the square root of k over m. And of course, k can actually be rewritten as f max, which is 29.05 divided by the displacement, which is two times the radius of the nucleons. But remember way back long ago we covered how speed equals frequency times displacement? So now, because we already solve for the frequency, all we have to do is multiply the equation times the displacement, and it'll give us the velocity. So for the displacement of the nucleons, let's plug in 2r sub n again, because that's how far the nucleons are apart from each other. Remember, the particles are like circles in two dimensions, and circles could only go in till they touch, and that's as far as they can go, so they're separated by two times the radius. So let's plug in some numbers. That F max, well, that's 29.05, like we already said. And I already covered how the displacement is two times the radius of the nucleons. And as for the mass, both the protons and the neutrons are about 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So we'll just use that number. And as for the radius of the nucleons, well, this is a little tricky. Let's go with the radius of a proton for now because they're pretty similar, the protons and the neutrons, but the value for the radius of a proton is a bit misleading because what we see when we look up the value for the radius of a proton, well, that's not the real radius of the proton. That's just the number that they assign. See, they say that the charge radius of the proton is really 0.8768 Fermi meters. Is This is the currently accepted universal value, but this is just a mathematical formulation because in reality, the proton is not a solid mass like a cue ball. It's more like the atmosphere of the Earth. It's fuzzy, if you want to look at it that way. Like, an electron cloud is fuzzy. It's dense in the middle, but then gets less and less dense as the farther you go out. So mathematicians and physicists, they don't like this fuzziness of the protons. They don't like how it's kind of mushy. So they like to measure it starting in where it's already it's more solid. They don't measure it from the end of its fuzziness. But that end of that fuzziness is the real radius of the proton. So that's what we're going to have to know to move on with this. And in the next segment, we're going to have some big surprises. Guarantee you that. Stay tuned.